Do you hear us? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, guys. So, uh, welcome to Noon Conference. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Erna Kojic. She is the uh, chief for the Infectious Diseases Division, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, tick-borne infections today. Thank you, Dr. Kojic, for uh, you know accepting to come to. Uh, lecture us. And the other thing that is important today, we're recording this lecture. It's going to be available for everyone in Zoom. We're going to send you the link. Well, thank you, Avinash, for inviting ah. me. I actually, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. That's the tick, the tick-borne infections. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. We'll talk a little bit about the tick itself or the vector and uh, discuss these uh, infections that are transmitted by uh, these ticks in our area or in the northeastern U U.S. That's anaplasma, babesia, Lyme, uh, a new kind of a Lyme infection, Borrelia miyamotoi, and we'll talk about Powassan. And then we'll talk a little bit about cases. So what are the tick-borne illnesses? It's a disease entity where there is the same vector that transmits all of these four um, organisms. And even though the, um, the vector tends to be specific, there's a huge overlap between these infections. So if you think of one of them, you should really uh, think of all four of them or all three of them. Um, they tend to follow a specific geographic, a seasonal pattern as you're probably aware of. And, but most of them have very similar protein symptoms, fever, malaise, myalgia, arthralgia, and plus or minus rashes. They tend to be all susceptible to doxycycline, except for Babesia and Powassan. And so these are the ticks. And I bring this up because it's not really um, it's not really the size of the tick that's the, that, that matters, it's whether it's engorged. And I'm sure you've heard about um, that the biggest risk is once the uh, tick has fed for at least 24 to 72 hours. Uh, but keep in mind that the size of the tick, it can be tiny, tiny. And in most of the cases, at least in terms of Lyme infection, patients have no recollection of, of having had a tick or found a tick because they tend to come on and fall off without patients knowing about it. Um, again, they tend to feed for hours and days, and they feed only once per life cycle. So these are the ticks, and this is, these are the geographic distributions uh, of the specific ticks. It's more for an ID, uh, but it helps to know that the, uh, where these ticks are. So Ixodes scapularis is the, this yellow, and this is, these, that's the tick that we are dealing with in this area. There is a Pacificus Ixodes, there's Amblyoma americanum, and then there's the overlap in distribution. If you look at all of the southeast, there is an overlap in distribution. That's where all, uh, most of these ticks can be found. Um, I'm going to kind of skip. Just keep in mind that we are now recognizing more and more types of ticks, believe it or not. There are people that work on that, and, and we're finding new uh, ticks. One was identified last year in New Jersey, and we do believe that those ticks are also capable of, of carrying those organisms. Um, as I mentioned, tick-borne illnesses are geographically confined. Uh, anaplasma t tends to be here, so the anaplasma used to be called, um, um, there used to be different names, it used to be granulocytic and monocytic, so the, monocy the granulocytic one is what we have, which is now called anaplasma, the monocytic one is in a little bit of a different distribution, but carried by the same tick. Babesiosis is mostly up in our area up here. It's called the, um, the American malaria because it presents in a very similar fashion. And then Lyme disease, those are, we are really in the hub of Lyme and this is spreading. I'm sure CDC will come up with a, a new, uh, newly updated maps because Lyme is spreading um, every year and we're predicting that it's going to be quite prevalent uh, in the coming year. Uh, ehrlichiosis, again, this, well, you can see it on, on here where uh, ehrlichia is as, a, uh, as opposed to anaplasma. 
those are both rickettsial organisms. It, as I said, it used to be called different rickettsials. But Ehrlichia is over here. And I put up here tularemia, mostly for your boards. There is always this question on boards about tularemia. Don't forget about that infection. It's still active. Every, every year there are a few cases, although it's a rare infection. And Rocky Mountain spotted fever, also a very uh, common and, and, and um, board question, again, with a completely different geographic distribution. So let's start a little bit about ehrlichiosis. As I said, it used to be divided into two, a human monocytic ehrlichiosis and human granulocytic, which is the one that we have here, which is now called anaplasma. Um, these are, they have different um, distributions. The HME, apparently, they're more likely to report um, a history of a tick bite. Um, they infect macrophages, and the, the disease severity can be mild to fulminant and probably underdiagnosed in many cases. Uh, anaplasma, that's what we have up here in the northeast. There's a bimodal seasonal distribution. It tends to happen early in the summer and, and then later in, in the fall. Uh, may frequently be subclinical uh, and predominantly um, affects neutrophils. Clinical manifestations, again, mild to fulminant, but they present with fevers, chills, headaches, myalgias, quite prominent, and arthralgias. And some people even have um, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, poor appetite. Um, and about a 10% of anaplasma cases, uh, they will present without any, any rashes. Uh, it's often called rashless Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, in fact, rashes can be very transient, and, and you know, even patients can miss that they even ever had a rash. Um, the peripheral smear is more, po is more often positive in an anaplasma than it is in other, other kinds, where you find these, you can actually see those morulae um, up to 80% versus 7% for others. So these are morula, and again, I put that up here because this is a, a, a common board question. So morula, anaplasma. Diagnosis and treatment. Um, you have to have a very strong clinical suspicion to send the, the, the serology. And the characteristic findings are leukopenia, with elevated LFTs, thrombocytopenia, and if you find the, see the morula, I mean, that takes a seasoned path person to see them. So you, you may or may not see those. But it, so leukopenia, elevated LFTs, almost always with our anaplasma. Um, the diagnosis is by serology. There's also a PCR that we have now, and actually you can uh, find that in EPIC. Um, serology is a positive at presentation in about 25% of cases. So again, clinical suspicion is, is key here. Uh, but at 30 days or within four weeks, almost everybody who has been exposed to a plasma will develop. Um, it should be almost because nothing is 100% in ID. Uh, the serology is sensitive during the first week of illness, but may decrease after the administration of, of antibiotics. So in many cases, if you catch the case is early and you, get, and you treat it, you may blunt the serologic um, um, response. So that's something to keep in mind. But if you demonstrate a fourfold increase in IgG specific antibody titers by IFA assays into serum, that, that clinches the diagnosis. And, um, but the antibodies tend to take, like with anything else, uh, seven to ten days to develop after the onset of clinical illness. Um, so the first sample should be taken the first week of illness and the second one two to four weeks, just like with any uh, uh, serologic diagnoses. The PCR is quite, is, is up to 70% sensitive, um, but it is quite specific. So uh, if you're suspecting anaplasma, that's, it's available now in more and more labs. You treat it with doxycycline. Um, and you, if you have a pregnant woman, you should use rifampin, which does have in vitro activity. Um, keep in mind that quinolones and chloramphenicol are in, ineffective. Any questions? 
You can chime in with questions if, if, if you feel so. Yeah. So el, el, one question regarding the smears. Should we be ordering a Buffy code? So guys, uh, for the interest, Buffy code is just like the leukocyte. Uh, so when you get like the the CBC uh, in the tubes, like the part that is just composed of white blood cells. So should we be asking for Buffy codes for diagnosis? Does this like increase the the sensitivity for, for the PCR? Uh, I love the or fact for the smears, like doing a smear of the Buffy. Code. Yeah, I love the fact that you're bringing up Buffy code because that's a it is what it is. It's a concentrated layer of cells that you can, and yes, it would increase uh, the sensitivity of detecting morole, but the, 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 the expertise in labs, it's, I don't know if it's there yet still to do the buffy codes, but buffy codes used to be very valuable. Um, moving on to babesiosis, again, this is the North American malaria. Babesia it was first described back in 1888. Um, and the first human case uh, was described back in, in a farmer in 1957 in Yugoslavia. And um, in the U.S., the first cases are dating back to 1969 in Nantucket, which is kind of the hub of where the ticks live. And there's about 100 species that can infect different vertebrates, um, very similar to actually to, to malaria or plasmodium falciparum. It is transmitted by Ixodes scapularis, and this is the life cycle. We like life cycles in ID. So the birds, white-footed mouse are, or deer are the reservoir, and they're primarily found in southern New England, upper Midwest, New Jersey, Virginia, and these states outlined here. Um, and there is also a um, transfusion-related um, uh, infections that's possible. So if you have somebody that keeps that, got, that has a fever spike after transfusion, which is somewhat higher than or more anemic after transfusion, because blood products are not screened for Babesia, it's not cost effective to do so. But something for you guys to keep in mind, it can be very effectively transmitted with transf transfusions. Uh, the incubation period is one to four weeks after a tick bite. But it can be up to up to ninety up to uh, nine weeks if it's transfusion related, and that has to do with the the um, amount of, of of organisms that you have in the transfused. Because as you know, they pull they can they can pull blood, and you can have a very low level of organism. Patients that have an intact spleen won't may or may not even get sick from it, but it's the asplenic, whether it's functional or surgical asplenic people that. Um, have a problem with Babesia. Uh, parasitemia can persist as long as 27 months with a mean of 82 days in untreated hosts. And uh, treatment clears the parasitemia by 30 days. And I put that up there because sometimes it takes a while to clear for antibiotics to clear uh, Babesia. So don't give up, keep going even if the uh, parasite burden is still there. Uh, so how do these patients present and how do we diagnose it? They present with malaise, fever, anorexia, abdominal pain, myalgias, arthralgias, and sometimes upper respiratory symptoms. So very similar to anaplasma, just sort of the, this un, un, undifferentiated febrile illness with aches and pains. Um, the parasitemia in patients with uh, with an intact spleen, you can go up to about 10%. We talk about a high burden of, of, of disease if it's over 5%, so anywhere between 5 and 10%, you should actually consider uh, transfusion um, exchange. Uh, asplenic people, they do not handle. Those are the people that tend to have a high morbidity and mortality from Babesia because they can't handle it. Uh, and they can have up to an 85% um, uh, parasite, parasitemia, which is very high. I mean, you, once you hit 50%, you are actually quite likely to, to die from it. Um, 
You can have this typical conjunctival injection, and rash is extremely rare with Babesia. If you see a rash, it's, you should be looking for something else. And keep in mind that some ticks carry multiple organisms, so you can have double or even triple, triple infections from one tick bite. Serology for Babesia is usually, pre, uh, is usually positive at the time of presentation, so that's why we typically tend to send the serology first. Um, but keep in mind also that there is a PCR now that's available in multiple places, including here. Um, peripheral smear, again, this looks very much like malaria, or, uh, specifically Plasmodium falciparum malaria. Do you know what these are called? Maltese crosses, yes, exactly. Either tetrads or Maltese crosses, and that sort of looks like just like this. How do you treat it? There are two, uh, two regimens that we tend to go as a first-line treatment. One is azithroatovaquone or clindaquinine. And it used to be that we thought the clindaquinone uh, would clear the blood more rapidly than the azithroatovaquone. That was sort of the thought. So in a severely acutely ill patient, we would tend to choose the clindaquinone. But since then, there are several studies that have come back, and uh, these regimens are pretty much equal. But the azithroatovaquone is a lot better tolerated because you don't need an EKG monitor with the quinine. Um, which can be, I mean, you need a CCU stay and you need a, a much closer monitoring with quinine than you do with azithroatovaquone. So in patient, or most patients, you can go with azithroatovaquone. Uh, um, do not transfuse because that's fueling the fire, even if they're quite quite anemic, the more blood you give, the more the more substrate you give to the, uh, to the uh, to the Babesia to cause more more pr problems. So stay away from that. Um, and as I mentioned, these regimens are equivalent for mild to moderate disease uh, with much less toxicity associated with azithroatovaquone, um, like 15% with azithro as compared with 72% with the clindaquinine. Quinine is difficult to give, and there's also, also a shortage now. I don't know if it's still there, but it, there was a shortage. Um, having said that, as I mentioned, the clindaquinone has traditionally been labeled as clearing the, the parasitemia uh, more rapidly, but I don't think that that translates into a, a clinical, imp more of a clinical improvement. Again, then we have the exchange transfusion, and you do need that for high parasite burden or for severe illness. So with anybody who's you consider it for a parasite burden of 5 to 10%. If it's over 10%, then you absolutely should uh, get those uh, team involved. Or if the parasite burden is rapidly growing, so let's say a diagnosis is like 4%, and in six hours it goes up to 9 or 10%, that's the time to think about um, exchange transfusion also. So very high parasite burden over 10%, or if it's rapidly rising despite initiating treatment. Um, this is not last week, this is from last year. So a 48 year old, and that was here at St. Luke's. So he came in with fevers, chills, headache, and cough. Uh, ended up having an LP done because the, prom the most prominent um, complaint was actually headache. Sent home, came back with ongoing fever, and that's sort of what tends to happen. Because these people are, they can be, if you have an intact spleen, again, they can be clinically quite stable. Um, exam non-focal, all he had was he was just febrile with lethargy, hemoglobin of 9, and this is what he had, and well, I took this picture pretty much on my phone because, I don't know, you can see it, this is a tetrad here. But you need, I bring this up because you need a seasoned pa uh, person looking at the gram stain or at the smear, and they are very good over here um, in our lab. To, to find this because you need to look a lot. You don't, it's not in every red, red cell. Any questions on Babesia? Does Doxy have any role here? No. Is there a reason? That Doxy doesn't work for it? It, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> I don't know. 
Yeah, because it works for anaplasma and, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, not for Babesia. Uh, I have a question that's actually related to um, um, a morning report that we had um, recently. So what's the natural history of this? And you kind of mentioned something like that, but what would yeah. you expect in a patient that is uh, that has a normal spleen and has normal immunity in terms of uh, do they clear the Babesia on their own yes. you know, treatment? Uh, and what percentage of patients sort of like uh, recover without any need for exactly. treatment? Exactly. A great question. So we do know that that these infections go unnoticed in many, many cases, because with an intact spleen, they will clear it. What percentage? We probably don't know that because it's underreported. Um, it's actually really the, the, the functionally asplenic people that, that get sick from this. And, um, but I don't, we don't have a percentage. We don't know how many of them clear. But just know that you don't necessarily have to. And we get these calls every now and then. If you have a patient in your clinic, let's say in, in Ryan Clinic, they come and you do a smear and you incidentally find it. And you may not be feeling too well. You may or may not need to treat. If this is a young person, just monitor it. As long as they're not very anemic, uh, you don't, may or may not need to treat. Asplenia is the key word here. Mm -hmm. Does patients with sickle cell have like the same protection with Babesia like as malaria or not? No, not for, not for Babesia, only malaria. That has to do with the receptor and, and no, does not apply with the tube. <laughs> yeah, that is a good thought. So Lyme, our all-time favorite. <laughs> um, the incidence of Lyme is definitely going up, and I'm waiting for the, for the updated numbers from the CDC. I think this is going to be, it's spreading, we know that. And not only is it spreading geographically, there seems to be more Lyme in areas that we already had a lot of Lyme. And these pictures are, are sort of speak for themselves. Again, the confirmed cases and probable cases. And I don't think it has to do only with the diagnosis of Lyme because the diagnosis of Lyme has been there for, for many, many years and it hasn't really changed that much. I mean, there are some new tests popping up, but not to change the epidemiology and significantly. Uh, when does Lyme happen? Again, we talked about seasonal variation and the Lyme months are from May to September, but we've been diagnosing them even for uh, October and November. And throughout the year, there's a smattering of cases. That's sort of people have been sick for a while, but still, but the summer months is when we see the most uh, cases of Lyme. Um, it has been different. I mean, if you, t t if you look at the textbook, it's been categorized into early localized and, and late Lyme. Lyme can be anything and anything can be Lyme, and, it's, uh, and that's sort of the bottom line there. I don't think these, these, this classification is that helpful cl clinically, um, but the early Lyme is erythema migrans, and that's important to know. You don't need to send the serologic test if you get a bullseye rash. Just treat it. You don't need to test it, because that's the earliest presentation of Lyme, and even if you send it, it can be negative. So any, whether it's negative or positive, it's not going to help you clinically. And if you treat it at this, at this stage, just like with anaplasma, you can actually blunt the serologic response to it. So just treat it. Um, I put these pictures up here because these bullseye lesions, that, this tends to be the site of the initial tick bite. And it can come in various shapes and forms. Sometimes they're multiple. Sometimes there's one of them. This is like the, ba the back of the knee, uh, often in areas where patients don't necessarily see it. So when you do get a patient, you should do a, a very thorough, um, thorough exam. You're more likely to get these cases in your, in your clinic than a, a, in a hospitalized patient. So um, it appears at the site of the bite within seven to 10 days. There is a wider range, but a week in, you usually get this red uh, lesion. In uh, African Americans, those can also look very unusual. Um, it can then rapidly expand. 
the median diameter is usually five centimeters, so this is a sizable orbit. I mean, you should be able to see it. Um, most have a single lesion, you can have multiple lesions, and they can, again, I underline this, they can have a very variable. The longer I do this, the more kinds of these rashes I see. Um, in theory, you could actually culture spirochetes from these lesions, but we never do that. Uh, we never biopsy it and we, we just never do. So my RENs, again, um, the majority of patients do have some constitutional symptoms. Again, just like flu-like illnesses, arthralgias, fatigue, headache, and neck pain. Um, in some cases, you can have no rash, and I say they're in a minority. The, in, in reality, a lot of these cases, they get the rash and it goes away and patient never, never saw it. So it's, it's hard to put a number on the prevalence of rashes. Um, the rashes obviously can occur, uh, occur in locations that are, uh, that are atypical for cellulitis, like in, in uh, wherever the, the tick bites, bites, popliteal fossa is what we saw before. Um, and if you don't treat it, I mean, you should treat Lyme, you should treat it if you diagnose it, just to prevent the more serious uh, consequences that, that can ha happen with untreated Lyme. Um, again, uh, if it's erythema migrans, this is a clinical diagnosis. You may or may not need to send the serology. Um, again, you can blunt the seroconversion with antibiotics. Um, PCR in this case is usually not helpful. And then you can have early disseminated um, early disseminated Lyme, and that's just the terminology used for if you get multiple. EM kind of like lesions, or if you get multiple skin lesions. Once it's disseminated, you're more likely to get a positive serology. How do you treat it? Again, doxy. Um, but amoxicillin is also has, has good effect for, for treatment. And cefuroxim uh, also works. Uh, both uh, effective in randomized prospective studies to treat, to treat this early line. Uh, IV is not needed. Remember, there are a few antibiotics that have, a, that have an excellent oral bioavailability, and you need to know these. And so doxy is one of them. Others are um, fluconazole, huh? linazolid. Um, so, um, yeah, so quinolones. I'm going to mention five, and when I see you in the hallway, I'll ask you about the five now. Just kidding. So linazolid, fluconazole, doxycycline, quinolones, and abactrim. Those are the common ones that you should know. You should not use those antibiotics IV unless there is no GI tract or if you have a, or if there is some kind of a GI absorptive problems. Almost 100% oral bioavailability. The good thing about doxy, it penetrates skin very well, as evidenced by the fact that it makes people sensitive, sun sensitive. Um, they get, they're more likely to get sunburns. But they should take doxy with avoiding dairy products. Dairy products can decrease the absorption of doxy by up to 30%. So uh, you should tell them the, not to take dairy products an hour before or two hours after taking the doxy. Uh, macrolides are less effective. Remember, just like with any spirochetes, once you start treating spirochetes and they start to die, you can develop this jarish herxheimer like reaction, which can occur in up to 15% of patients within 24 hours of starting therapy. So you give them the doxy. If the fever gets worse and they start get shaking chills, don't stop the doxy. Keep going. It's just their reaction. And I can tell you anecdotally, if you, if you ever end up working in a Lyme clinic, patients know this. So... One, for example, she walked in and said, oh, this was not Lyme this time because I didn't herx. They even have this terminology for it, for it that the, the treatment works if, if I get a good herx reaction. So I don't know what to make of that. Uh, the rash tends to resolve in one to two weeks, so it's a transient rash. Uh, 
um, whether or not you treat. So the rash comes and goes away, but the systemic symptoms take a, uh, a lot longer to resolve, sometimes as long as, as several months, and an older uh, individual even sometimes more than three months. So that's something to keep in mind when, when giving advice to people. And then you get the early disseminated, which is mostly um, multiple annular secondary skin lesions, like I showed on one of the abdomen there on the prior image, and also often accompanied by constitutional symptoms. You can even have diffuse erythema or urticaria. You can get migratory pains. This is the phase that you get, you know, today it's my shoulder, then it's the knee, um, but different uh, sort of traveling arthralgias that you see with Lyme. Uh, cardiac manifestation can occur in 5% of the early disseminated, and the most common one is the AV block. Uh, but you can also get myopericarditis, you can get pancarditis, and any kinds of cardiac uh, manifestations. We tend to traditionally in the US treat the cardiac manifestations with IV, but in uh, Europe they're actually treating both the Bell's palsy and the cardiac manifestations with, with doxy, with good Good, good outcomes. Early disseminated disease, you can also have a, all kinds of neurological manifestations that can come as, uh, as meningitis kind of a picture, which is why the case that we saw here last year, he came in twice and the, the working diagnosis was really meningitis. Um, and what do you find on the CSF? You find lymphocytic pleocytosis, so lymphocytes, just like aseptic meningitis increased protein, and the glucose gets typically normal. You don't have to have a low glucose. Or um, You can have encephalitis, where people just complain about the cognitive uh, problems, like I'm just not remembering things. Uh, anywhere from that to a radiculopathy, and cranial neuritis or, or, or facial palsies, which is actually very common. Um, there is a questionable role for LP if there is no CNS manifestation. You probably do not need to do, even if you, if they present with Bell's palsy, you don't need to do an LP on that person. And how do you diagnose it? It still is the two-tiered uh, antibody testing, so the ELISA for screening and checking the bands only if the ELISA is positive. Um, and then there is a PCR, and we'll talk a little more about that. Did I know that? Um, the antibody testing applies to both serum and to CSF. The PCR is not helpful for, from blood. It's only helpful if you have a joint aspirate. It's not helpful for CSF or for serum. For Lyme, you only use the PCR from a joint aspirate. Usually, typically, it tends to affect the knee. How do you treat it? Again, 14 days is probably enough, but again, we typically do ten, do four weeks anyway. I think we're treating ourselves most of the times. Uh, doxycycline is the uh, is the first line therapy, but again, cefiroxin and amoxicillin also have good clinical efficacy. Um, Again, if it's cardiac manifestation with just the, the AV block, the first degree block, doxy is fine. You don't need to put up a line and, and do IV treatment. Uh, for hospitalized patients, if there is a more severe block, like a full block, we tend to start with ceftriaxone, and once they start to improve, uh, we switch over to doxy, and you can treat for a week with ceftriaxone and discharge them to home with doxy. Uh, particularly if they're symptomatic from the block with um, syncope, dyspnea, or even chest pain, or the pancarditis kind of a picture. And then any uh, more advanced blocks, I see there are several budding cardiologists here, you can uh, start with ceftriaxone and switch to uh, doxy. And then there's the late Lyme. So that, those are the patients that can actually present in the middle of the winter but had the uh, exposure over the summertime. So that's mostly musculoskeletal presentation where they get um, this migratory poly polyarthritis. Knee tends to be a, a favorite for Lyme. Um, you get a swollen red knee and it's literally, it can get quite swollen with, with Lyme. 
and it can come and go. So it can wax and wane. So you can get, you know, like, yeah, I had a swollen knee for a month last summer, then it went away and then it came back. And that is also quite typical for Lyme, sort of this up and down process. Um, um, it can resolve where it, the swelling goes away, but the patient tends to complain about ongoing knee pains, even if you don't treat. And it can stay there waxing and waning for years, actually. Even if you treat, 10% of patients do have a persistent joint inflammation even after you're done with the doxycycline. Um, and it tends to happen mostly with the knee where you treat and they fail the oral doxy. And what I typically do if they fail a doxy, I treat them, I give them um, a, a course of IV of triaxone. Late Lyme. Again, those are patients that had it, typically live in, in, Lyme, in Lyme areas, but never got diagnosed. A lot of people um, just sort of ignore it. They get better, they get worse, get better. And, and in many cases, we have no way of knowing when the actual exposure was. Because it's sometimes you can get, if you catch them earlier, you can repeat the Lyme serology and see if there's a progression or regression of bands. And that can give you a better a sense of a timeline um, but either way, you should treat them. We tend to treat for a month if we don't know when the exposure was, if they do not have any evidence of neuroborreliosis, because the longer that you have the organism uh, in the body, the like, likelier you are to get some CNS involvement. And also, for, for patients with recurrent swelling, after initial course of doxy, we tend to go to either you can, de, you know, de, it's like on a case to case basis. You can repeat the, the oral one or you can just go to the IV uh, for us for us for a failed uh, oral treatment. Um, there is something called so I don't know how familiar you are with the Lyme world. There are two schools of thought. One is the IDSA where we have these clear guidelines and those guidelines have been, I mean, tested again and again because some decades ago there was a, a huge um, a lawsuit for to, to IDSA, which sort of forced them to, to look into the, the guidelines with a lot <laughs> under a microscope. And there is no such thing as a chronic Lyme. So I'm gonna. So if you if you if you follow the IDSA recommendation, there is no such thing as a as a, a chronic Lyme. There is also a, a, a society I'm gonna say called ILADS or International Lyme Association, which is comprised of of both patients and providers. A lot of providers also, where they do believe in chronic Lyme, and you may or may not come across a patient that has been on on antibiotics for years for, for this uh, chronic. There is no good evidence to suggest that once you treat Lyme that it does not um, go away. There is, however, this entity called a post-treatment Lyme syndrome, and I'm, I'll get to that a little bit, which has to do with ongoing symptoms even after successfully eradicating the actual infection. And that has to do with cytokines and all sorts of cascades of, of, of or inflammatory markers that, that Lyme sets off. Uh, neurologic, 10% uh, of, patient, of untreated patients that have Lyme will end up getting neurological uh, consequences. And that you do need objective diagnosis uh, often it involves neuropsych testing or even neurology and LP. Clinical manifestations are as outlined there, encephalopathy, polyneuropathy, encephalomyelitis, which is an entity which is quite difficult to diagnose, uh, dementia, and even psych dis disturbances, depending on which part of the brain uh, Lyme affects. Um, this, the guidelines are old. They still um, are, aren't really updated. So we're treating, as you see, the PO treatment is doxy number one, but you can also use amoxicillin and cefiroxim. Macrolides are less, infect, are less effective, so only use it as a, as a last resort. You may need to treat for longer. Uh, the IV preferred treatment is a ceftriaxone two grams daily. An alternative, you can use cefotaxim or even penicillin. 
remember spirochetes it's just like syphilis so penicephtriaxone and penicillin work for these spirochetes we are still using this traditional two-tier testing you send an ELISA if it's antibody positive then that is automatically triggered over to a western blot um, keep in mind that it's an antibody test. It can take, you know, up to four, four, even eight weeks for uh, it to become positive. 33% are positive at two weeks. Uh, but if it's disseminated or if it's neurological, you should have a positive ELISA test. So if the ELISA is negative, you should seriously question uh, if the CNS manifestations are Lyme or not. There are a lot of false positives. Remember, this, these are spirochetes, uh, syphilis. Uh, there's mu multiple spirochetes that can cause, um, um, that, that you can have in the body. Even in the GI tract, there are some uh, spirochetes there which are not causing any, any, any problems. Um, false, false positives have also been uh, documented with EBV, with malaria endocarditis and lupus obviously lupus patients they have antibodies uh, floating around making all sorts of false positive tests uh, the western blot what is a positive test you have to have either two or three uh, two, at least two out of three igm bands or five out of ten igg bands positive to for it to be a, a positive test. There are major limitations. I don't know how familiar with our, you are with these bands. When you look at it, you can um, the viral the visual scoring can be very subjective because if it's faint, a one person may say that it's a positive band, but another one a negative. So just keep in mind that there are limitations to these tests, and they, it can be a very subjective interpretation. There are false positive ones. So again, cross reacting. Uh, to um, other endemic spirochetes. But in patients who have been ill uh, for more than a month, an IgM alone is more likely to represent a false positive. And specifically, so the, the three IgM bands that you have is 23, 39, and 41. And if you get this combination, 23 and 41, in a patient that has had symptoms over over a month, it is more likely to be um, um, a false positive IgM because what happens naturally, you you get the IgM positives, and as the, you start to lose the IgM bands, that's when you start to get the IgG bands. And if you have a patient that's been sick for over a month, did not develop IgG bands, and has is losing the Ig, and and still has these IgM bands, you can safely say that it's false positive. There is a whole slew of lab tests out there that have been used to diagnose Lyme. And IDSA is still rec not recommending, we're still saying you should do the two-tiered ELISA test. And these are very expensive tests. Um, there's a whole list of There's a urine test, a lymphocyte transformation test, a reverse Western blot where they start with the IgM bands and then go to ELISA. None of these have been proven to be helpful. Except maybe the, the quantitative CD57 lymphocyte assay. That's a, a, a test that can, that may become something that we will use in an acute setting like in, a, in an ED. Oh, what time is it? Okay, we will wrap up. Uh, Post-Lyme post syndrome, post-Lyme treatment disease syndrome, that's when you have ongoing infections. There are criteria for it in the guidelines. I deliberately did not uh, put this as a readable thing just to point it out to you that this, there are guidelines for that. <laughs> treatment is symptomatic. Borrelia miyamotoi is a new uh, Borrelia that has been, well, new, it's dating back to 2000. Um, it was iso first isolated in 95. Um, something to keep in mind, those, it popped up. You need a specialized lab. The regular testing may not uh, pick it up. I'll skip this. And then um, the fourth organism that these same ixodes ticks carry is powassan. That's a virus. Um, and, um, 
a, a virus uh, similar to dengue and, and uh, uh, yellow fever. Uh, something to keep, uh, just to keep it, it presents with a meningoencephalitis typically in older people. You need to send that for specialized testing if you want to diagnose that. I guess we don't have a time for the case, but uh, the, this case um, has to do with a patient that presented with Neuralime, and what the take-home message is, the serum Lyme was positive, but in order to, to document CNS Lyme, you need to send CSF for serology. Don't send the, the PCR, because it's not... Um, and then you look at the bands that you had serologically, they had all the ones, but they had new, new bands in the CSF, which means that there's intrathecal band, uh, Lyme band production. That clinches the diagnosis. Okay. Um, just to end with, you should advise patients that do a lot of hiking in new, the New England area to use permethrin for clothing. Kill sticks on, co on contact. You can use it either as a spray or a kit for your washing machine. And to use DEET for skin, at least 28%. That's the most effective one, so it's the strongest stuff. All right.